Welcome back to our Succession podcast. I'm Jenny. I'm here with Savannah. This week we're talking about season four, episode eight, America Decides. The title of the episode feels very pointed. Very ironic title. I love that choice. We're going to try and structure this by at first just kind of talking about uh, the nuts and bolts of what happened on election night, some of maybe the real world parallels going on there and then from there kind of go into the character stuff in this episode because it was really just non-stop all of that you know woven in together but for the purposes of this podcast we'll try and kind of separate those into two piles here and i wanted to start by just talking about um this episode kind of being the culmination of this recurring theme in succession, which is like the function of spectacle and the way that you can make your own reality is something that Logan says in uh, the pilot episode. This really comes to fruition in, in this episode. They chose Mankin as a candidate because he's good TV and Roman says we just made good TV tonight. But even though they try and minimize that impact, we can see the way that the speech act of calling a state, calling an election has real world impacts, even though it really is just kind of a projection. They can try and say, oh, it's going to get, you know, settled in the courts. It doesn't really mean anything. But it, but it really does. It confers like a lot of legitimacy to call an election. And that whole idea is also very fascistic, the idea of like myth making and valuing the power of will over reality. If nothing is true, then all is spectacle. So I think it's showing like not only that uh, Waystar and ATN are complicit in fascism, but are actually actively aiding and abetting fascism. Even characters like Kendall and Shiv that don't want to believe that that's what they're doing, you know, ultimately, um, it's all just a big show. And that is like a very fascistic idea. Yeah, the consequences are not going to affect them. We're not going to see the consequences of any of this on the show. And at the end of the day, they aren't political in the way that we are, even if Shiv and Kendall do actually share our values. I found it interesting how throughout the episode, they really minimized the amount of impact they were having. Um, with calling Wisconsin, they're like, well, there's still a cushion. Just calling this one state is not actually calling the election, but that is 100% what they did and they could not take back. They tried to kind of add an additional layer of abstraction to that call and say, oh, it's a pending call, but it's still a call. Uh, it's still it's the same thing. It's just like you try and kind of hide between these words, but you're still doing something even when you try and kind of talk your way around it. And that is what boxed them in into, you know, they had to call the presidency because the other news outlets were calling Arizona. Arizona obviously was going uh, to Mankin, so then, well, now you already called Wisconsin, so... Pending call was just to, to make themselves feel a little bit better. Well, you don't want us to call it a call. Okay, we'll call it a pending call. It doesn't mean anything. It's still, it's still the same thing. It's just trying to reassure themselves. I think that after the first chunk of this season, and especially last week, we could see that the business stuff didn't matter at all at this point, right? It's also stupid. It's not really going to impact anything in the real world, whichever way this like acquisition shakes out, pivoting to the election here is a good choice to show that the same kind of personal dynamics of the family that we've been seeing play out with these business dealings that aren't as, you know, consequential. Now they're doing the exact same thing, but with the future of the country and the presidency. So it's quite chilling. Yeah, I think it was a good change of pace to focus on the election, finally. And the two do connect, and this did move the business plot along a little. Though I was really feeling the, in this episode, what is even their idea of the future here, right? Like, Kendall is trying so hard to prevent the deal from going through, but they are going to get eaten by tech one way or another. There's no future away star where he's continually the CEO and nothing actually changes. I mean, I feel like Roman knows they're in a sitcom, sort of. He said in this episode, in this episode, nothing actually matters, dad's dead, he knows nothing is going to change from their actions, but I think Kendall and Shiv still have not accepted that yet. Yeah, Roman is full, like, nihilist this episode. Nothing matters, um, this is all just a show, it's just a good night of TV, which I think is one of his strengths in business, that he's able yeah. to kind of completely separate from that, but when it comes to something like this, that 
you know, Shiv was right when she said things do happen, Rome. That was a really impactful moment. And, you know, I know that in a lot of this show, we haven't seen these characters catch real consequences for just about anything. But that line um, and the way they were, you know, smearing Tom on like PGM at the end of the episode, I I don't know if I would say that there's not going to be any any consequences for these characters. I mean, this this could actually be kind of a big deal for the business and for them. It could be a big deal, but they're going to be okay at the end of the day, I guess, is what I would say. I did appreciate that moment from Shib and how they really did show that, like, Shib does care about what's happening here. Kendall does care. They just prioritize other things over that. The way this election goes down uh, has a lot to do with the situation in Milwaukee, where there were, like, 100,000 absentee ballots that were burned, um, which is a really interesting scenario because there's no recent precedent for this exact scenario for sure but it also has kind of analogs to like the 2020 like stop the steal situation where absentee ballots were you know coming in for days afterwards and they were kind of skewing democratic for reasons that made sense but also really fed into that narrative of like oh where are these votes coming from and of course also to the 2000 election with just it being called and then kind of contested so An interesting situation. I liked the fact that it was Milwaukee. I watched this episode with my parents because I had just moved out of my of my apartment on Sunday. So I'm staying with them for a few days. And yeah, my parents met in Milwaukee. My sister and I were born there. So every time they said Milwaukee during the episode, my parents were like, yeah, fuckheads in Milwaukee. Let's go. (laughs) Milwaukee is a really interesting city kind of politically and and demographically. I think it's actually the most racially segregated city in America. I saw that at some at some point that was true. I don't know if it's still true. Yeah, Wisconsin politics, kind of crazy. I thought one part that was really interesting here was the way that Roman sent those like talking points to Ravenhead that were really pulling directly from that conversation he had with Shiv, where he was kind of seeing what she was saying, and then just like bouncing it off to Ravenhead to respond to. And this was probably actually the most frustrating scene for me to watch was what Ravenhead was saying, because what Shiv and what like Darwin were saying made sense and was true, but also the arguments that Roman and Ravenhead were using to respond to it are just so difficult to like argue against. Oh, you're saying the fire's racist now? And you don't actually know what's on those ballots. It's just coming from a completely different um, place, I guess. Roman is actually really good at this. We spent so long debating whether or not the kids could actually do the job. We forgot that we don't want them to do the job. They would do very bad things with the job. This was a big win for Roman this episode. I mean, by the end of it, he is in the most powerful position that any of the Roy siblings have ever been in. But yikes. Yikes. <laughs> yikes, indeed. I really love the fire plot in general. I think they did a good job of balancing parallels to uh, many recent elections. I've heard a lot from podcasters this week that they're very uh, triggered by this episode. I think a lot of us were. Uh, but they balanced it well with things that did feel very fresh. As soon as they mentioned the fire at the beginning and started blaming the left, you immediately know it's actually the right. False flag. False flag. Well, and speaking of the kind of real world parallels, what I think is interesting about Mencken as a candidate is that he's he's not Trump, I think, either in presentation, in style, the fact that Mencken's a true believer, whereas Trump's just a savvy grifter for the most part. I really agreed with something that Justin Kirk, who plays Mencken, said in a couple different interviews this week where he said that Mencken's not necessarily a mirror of any current mainstream politicians, but that he's sort of a window into like five minutes from now. And I think that feels really true, that you could see someone like this kind of popping up in the next election cycle, um, because it does feel like the trajectory that we're on, which I think is why this is such a frightening episode, because it's not just like Trump all over again. It's kind of someone who's maybe a little savvier, more of like a true believer, which I think is worse than a grifter. I know that Jesse Armstrong and Kara Swisher kind of got into that on the podcast, and I was like, I agree with Jesse. I think true believers are scarier. Yeah. <laughs> so what do you think about Mencken just as a candidate? That's a loaded question. Uh, <laughs> I feel like when Mencken first appeared, there were a lot of Trump comparisons being made 
So I'm glad that by now he seems to have distinguished himself enough. And I've heard like five different names be compared to Megan this week, which is great, I think. You really can't compare it to any one election or situation because we've just been on such a downward spiral, I would say. Like, it's not like the 2020 election is so separate from the 2016 election. It's all feeding into each other. Yeah, I don't want to do 2024 guys can we (laughs) no i think this being played in 2023 is adding to people's anxieties a lot i know i really don't want to do it (laughs) can we just you know pandemic reasons we give another three years before we have another election yeah the republicans would love that (laughs) another power grab from the libs over covid So in Megan's acceptance speech, I mean, I think the term, you know, dog whistle is almost pretty light for what was going on here. This was pretty, pretty direct in a lot of ways. You know, welfare kings and queens is not even a dog whistle anymore. That's just like a directly racist term. But I think it's interesting kind of in conjunction with what we learned about Mankin's policies in season three, like Shiv at one point described him as like Medicare for all, abortions for none. And then in his scene with Roman, he says that, you know, people trust people who look like them, they will give more in tax dollars to help them. It's not this sort of more traditional conservative dog whistle where we're going to cut social spending and that's sort of our veiled way of hurting minorities. Instead, we're actually kind of pro things like Medicare, but only for white people, right? We sort of have this ethno-state, like utopia idea that is what is so appealing, I think, to a lot of people about, about this kind of rhetoric. It could be so great if we just didn't have all this goddamn diversity. Yeah, that end speech was really chilling because of how subtle it was, I would say. Obviously, a lot of the writers on the show have also been involved in Veep, but I think it's important that this episode felt nothing like an episode of Veep to me. Like, I think if it was Veep, it would have been way more overt and somewhat comedic, but it really hit because this was something that you could see someone actually saying and really being compelling with the right. I also found it interesting how everyone watching, like, none of the cast that we had seen throughout the episode and who ultimately got him elected looked happy at all. They don't actually particularly want him to be president. Yeah, the VPS thing was probably when Connor did his little rhymes about I can be your guy in Uruguay. Um, (laughs) That was really recalled Selena Meyer's iconic song. (laughs) Connor would fit in well on Veep. He had the VPS kind of subplot here. (laughs) Yeah, I, I agree that no one looked happy with the speech, but do you think that there was maybe a part of Kendall that longs for something pure and proud? that longs for a clean slate. They really were playing up his kind of reaction to that speech. Yeah, they were really playing up the ideas of cleanliness and dirt in this episode. Uh, Kendall calls Shiv a piece of dirt, very specifically. I think he does long for something clean in that way. And honestly, listening to the speech myself, I was like, oh, I, you know, removed completely from context. That does sound pretty nice, right? That's how politics works, you know? You're like, yeah, something clean, something... Wait, what a second. <laughs> That's what a dog whistle is. Kendall is someone who kind of wants wants a clean slate, wants to be this um, new guy, a leader willed into being. Yeah, and in a way, I think he's also kind of given up on that concept, or often does. He's like, well, fuck it, I'm already a bad guy, might as well keep going. Well, that's a good kind of segue into talking about just the character dynamics, uh, especially between the three siblings in this episode. Um, Shiv's politics definitely align with her like self-interest, which is an important thing to keep in mind. And Sarah Snook kind of brought that up in the after show that it was sort of convenient for her that she didn't have that conflict like that Kendall had in this episode. She didn't have to really see like which one won out if she was forced to choose. Until later. I'm glad we eventually got that so it wasn't Shiv being moral versus Kendall and Roman, you know, serving their self-interests. Roman really knows what he wants maybe for the first time all season. (laughs) He's very focused. Yeah, and then Kendall's definitely caught in the middle. He has this sort of personal investment with his daughter Sophie and he gets a call from Rava earlier and um, there was such a great 
Logan parallel here with him having them tailed covertly instead of like talking to them really made me think a safe room and those anti-suicide barriers when why talk to your son when you can just wall him in that's a good catch god did she even have a line I feel like she didn't get to speak but just no, the brief shot that. of her face while he's on the phone not even speaking directly to her but so upset. I love you she that hates her dad <laughs> you know I think Maybe Kendall can break the cycle just because he doesn't see his kids. Like, Logan was a very involved father. And maybe Kendall just not being involved is going to be the best for them. Kendall is abusing his kids in a different way. He's forging his own path. (laughs) In a new and unique way. Yeah. Well, I definitely want to talk about the scene between Kendall and Roman when their sort of personal grudges get called up so directly here when Roman says, oh, you just big brother it. What do you think about this scene? I love this. And I think the thing about siblings is you never let anything go ever. There are things when you were four years old that you'll still be talking about when you're 40, as we saw here. I was relieved to finally hear Kendall fighting back a little. Even though it was someone out of self-interest, I was just screaming at him in the first few scenes when he was sitting there clearly uncomfortable with this and not doing anything. Roman's language in this scene really jumped out to me. I mean, in this show, you know, business is my fucking. The way that we talk about business and sex are, I mean, the way they talk about business is far more sexual than the way they talk about sex. Yeah. I think one of my favorite threads throughout the show is that, you know, Logan is kind of the master of this, you know, sexually dominant language. I heard you bent for him and he fucked you. But when Kendall and Roman try to mimic that, it doesn't work. Like, Kendall's just like, oh, I'll, I'll, I'll give him a reach around. I'll give him a blowjob. And Roman's like, yeah, that guy wants to fuck me so bad. It makes him look stupid. They just sound gay when they try and they, do it. And then because Logan's, they are gay. Because they are gay. And then Logan's just, like, calling his sons homophobic slurs. He's like, God, my fucking sons. Um, but there is a really direct kind of connection between, well, especially Roman, like, Roman's sexual impotence but also the way that he like does business he does not conduct business in dominant way at all his style is a lot more like seduction i mean his biggest wins come from when he has these one-on-ones yeah with men in bathrooms and they're coded in a certain way very purposefully i would argue so it's just it's just interesting the way that here in this scene, he's like speaking in such an aggressive way and saying, you know, the country's just a big pussy waiting to get fucked, which is a line that made me go, Ugh! the first is just like so gross. They were really testing our comfort with our Blorbos in this episode. Oh, God. Yeah, don't even talk to me about Roman. <laughs> it's a tough week for Roman girlies, tough week for Kendall girlies, show girlies, we're all going through it. Tough week for everyone. I do feel like Roman is a little better at the sexually aggressive language than Kendall is, even though he's not really on Logan's level. Like, I was genuinely uncomfortable with Roman's comments in this episode. It wasn't like, oh, you just sound silly. Like, it sounded actually aggressive. You know, again, his business practices are very different. Right, because the way that he wins here is by having this weird (laughs) psychosexual relationship with Mankin. He wins by fucking the candidate. Yeah, you can say we, we are going to get into the Roman and Mankin, like, post-mortem at the end of this. But for now, we're going to pretend to be serious people. And <laughs> but stay tuned. We are going to talk about it. Don't worry. We're going to fucking talk about it. I don't think they're worried. <laughs> they're not worried. We haven't been able to stop talking about it. Yeah, and then the scene between Kendall and Shiv was really wonderful. Um, you know, Kendall, I thought, was very honest. And it was sort of a surprising show of self-awareness and honesty. Yeah from him maybe slight ulterior motive but not much i don't think yeah i think he was being honest in this scene i really love this scene and i think they really captured the way that when you go to talk to someone about your insecurities it sounds kind of staged like you know what you're gonna say and you kind of want them to say no you're not that it kind of tells the line between sincerity and insincerity because it is actually how you feel uh but it comes off a bit awkward to actually do that, you know? And it kind of did echo his confession about the waiter in the finale. Uh, again, she was kind of going around the uh, whether you're a good guy question. And once she does start saying, no, you're, you're a good guy, you're a good guy, Kendall, that did not feel honest to me. No, it didn't to me either. And I think 
right away it really felt like she was kind of playing to his view of himself like he he wants to believe that he's a good person so it, it did feel like sort of immediately manipulative to him and then later on when he realizes that that she's been playing him he he immediately thinks that that was a lie and you know it sounded <laughs> kind of sounded like one it sounded like one i think Chib loves her brother but she doesn't think very well of him Yeah, the scene where Shiv is caught in her lie. Top 10 anime betrayals. Fantastically filmed. Also, I know that we've been really indulging in the Greg hate, and this was not like, it didn't make me like Greg, but I'm glad that he fucking did something in an episode that had consequences. Yes, okay, I actually did want to talk about Greg a little bit. Yes. Greg can always detect who has the most power here. Like, I thought this was great the way they went back to Shiv and Greg. At the very beginning of the series, you know, Greg was between Shiv and Roman, and he chose Shiv. He could tell, Shiv is the one I really want on my side here. But it shows just how far Shiv has fallen and how little power she has at this point that Greg was just like, yeah, whatever, I'm gonna help Kendall, obviously. Yep, no hesitation. And he gave gave Shiv a little smirk through the glass as he was walking away. Yeah. <laughs> That was nuts. It is amazing how much more enjoyable Greg is when he contributes to the plot. I know, that's like all I've been wanting. And it it, it kind of builds up. I mean, I, I could see now like the seeds of that last episode and he's hanging out with Matson. So sure, they sold it. I'm no longer as critical of the Greg stuff <laughs> in the but past two episodes. In the past, yeah, you better qualify that Beyond because that, we don't know what's going to happen from here. You can't trust Greg as far as you can throw him, and you can't throw him very far because he's six foot seven. And Shiv, it was just kind of interesting and shows like how little she knows about Greg. Maybe her just ability to read people's not so great because she thought she could just like weakly threaten him and like vaguely threaten him. Like you're not gonna kill him. What are you talking about, Siobhan? It's Greg. They don't take him seriously. You need to offer him something. Greg is a carrot guy. Give him Greg a is carrot. a carrot guy. He. He's only doing any of this because he wants something out of it for himself. You're right, she's not that good with people or good at reading people. I mean, it always gets me on rewatch in season two how long she believes that Kendall has some sort of deal with Logan and is the one blackmailing Logan instead of the other way around. Oh, like, she just yeah, has these point. ideas about people and she gets very stuck in them and has trouble changing her opinion, which is a problem a lot of people have. Her relationship with Matson comes out here and Kendall just immediately turns on her, really follows that feeling of betrayal just all the way through to, well, now I'm now I'm with Roman, now I'm with Mencken. Kendall makes fun of Shiv's stuttering in this scene, which oh really broke my heart because, you know, it... It's Internalized common... stutter phobia. Kendall, Mr. Stutter over yeah, here. Yeah, like we know Kendall had a childhood stutter. He very often slips back into it and Logan gives him such a hard time about it. And here he is doing it to Shiv. Even though Shiv kind of got herself into this mess by trying to play both sides, by, um, you know, keeping all her options open. As she always probably, does. Yeah, probably one of her biggest weak points there. Even with all of that, it is very painful to see that when they turn on her, they really just go the super, like, misogynistic route, especially Roman. Yeah. You know, calling her hysterical, saying, oh, this is because you broke up with your boyfriend. He was just awful to her. I appreciate how earlier in the episode, Tom gets all misogynistic on her and they try to defend her, but very quickly once they realize she's betrayed them. Shiv has been around men for a long time. Like everyone in her family is a man. She doesn't see her mom as much. She is the type of woman who thinks that she can kind of escape misogyny by siding with men, by selling out other women. Being a cool girl. And it's... Yeah, be a cool girl. And it's it it doesn't like make me feel good to see her like proven wrong in that. Like it's really sad to see her, you know, still deal with the sexism from and it's really like all the men in her life in this scene, her brothers and Tom just like all turn on her. Yeah. She needs if she's not gonna have female friends, she should at least have like male lovers or friends who are not related to her work at all. I think that would be good for her. I feel like it was somewhat uh, disillusionment that made Kendall react this way here. Obviously, he's very angry. I think that was the primary driver in him uh, siding with Robin. But also, 
he thought Sid was a good person, telling him he's a good person. He's like, no, they're no good people, so fuck it, right? Oh my god, you're so right. <laughs> he's like, whatever, I've decided to go full nihilist now. Yep. <laughs> Some people just can't make a deal, Figurette. <laughs> well, are we ready for our Roman Mankin postmortem? I have always been ready. So, um, Roman Mankin truthers, even if we lost, I want it correctly characterized as a huge victory. Yeah. <laughs> A certain subset of us were really looking forward to this guy coming back on our screens. And, you know, I think, I think we won. I feel like I won. And at the end of the day, we're creating our own, that's, that's, that's what they did. Okay, they created Mankin victory so we can create a Roman Mankin victory. I'm calling it, we won. We're calling it. Yeah. Like, Mankin's texting him eggplant emoji. All right. All right. Um, it also kind of jump scared me when Roman called him Jared. Yeah. Like, first name basis. Shit. <laughs> we missed out on some stuff. They've been talking. They had a very like tight rapport. The last six months went to of go Roman's see him. life. There is a lot we missed. Like I don't think we've actually missed that much for Kendall Ship, but Roman. Roman's been hanging out with this guy or at least calling him and texting him. I think they've been hanging out. The scene where Kendall says that he's threatened by their relationship. And Kendall, you know, he has referred to Logan's relationship with presidents as being kind of a sexual relationship on two separate occasions when he called Logan a high class hooker for presidents and then when he said you pissed off your yeah. fucking boyfriend the president he's like not quite putting the dots together but almost he's they're like, not I think putting my the brother. dots together at all they're just being homophobic Kendall and Shib but they don't actually think it's happening you know he called him as soon as he got off that fucking stage he was man. like two seconds was he I'm even sure off wife the stage? and son were still right next to him he was like fuck you wife and son I'm calling my little boy toy. My favorite Roman Mankin detail of the episode is actually that Mankin has a son. Love that. The daddy issues. Yes. Woo. It was a very deliberate decision on the writer's part. Well, and actually in the official podcast this week, Jesse Armstrong said Roman lost his father and maybe he's looking for someone to fill that role. And there's a bunch of other psychological stuff that drives him to support an authoritarian. Yep. The usual vibe of a Jesse Armstrong interview is, go girl, give us nothing. But he he gave us quite a bit in that little two-sentence quote right there. That's more than we usually get from this guy about character motivations. I know that in every interpretation I have of the show, I am 100% right. But it's so nice to hear Jesse, our dad, kind of confirm yeah. it. Exactly. Just, it's nice to it's hear nice. it once in a It's like, you know, someone saying, I love you, even though you know they love you. Well, I wanted to just talk about Roman's like sexuality because jokes aside if we're going to say that there is this sort of sexual tension between like Mankin and Roman and if we're going to say that's maybe on purpose which I kind of think it's on purpose it's totally on purpose you know what does that mean like why why are they doing this do they think all gay people are fascists yes um no I'm kidding I mean Um, homophobia (laughs) But there aren't really good characters on this show. To I know, I'm kidding. But they did make the fascist gay. Roman is canonically queer. Yeah. You're not a serious person if you think Roman's straight. And yeah, there's the personal trainer thing, which is definitely the most kind of concrete. And actually, in a recent interview, Karen Culkin said that that was actually intended to be more more explicit in season one like an explicit affair with his personal trainer and it got kind of you know shuffled around and like downplayed a little bit but then of course it was brought up then in like subsequent seasons with references to it so i think very very clear what that what that message is so um it just makes me a little insane to think about roman being this queer kid who got slapped around by his dad and put in a dog pound by his brother and maybe he liked it but he doesn't remember it that way and then he got sent off to military school and maybe he chose to go but he doesn't remember it that way and now he has this like undeniable attraction to like fascistic masculinity that's pretty crazy like you love the boot because you love to be kicked by it Woo. yeah we talked before about how Kieran mentioned previously that they considered making Roman, like, gay or bi at the beginning of the show. And the personal trainer detail they shared, but recently does expand. Like, I didn't think they had actually thought about for that long. You know, they actually wrote the character in and everything. And with everything they've done since, it, yeah. it was not buried. Like, they keep bringing it up right. more and more. I was surprised by how explicit they got with Logan's homophobia at the end of season three. 
Yeah. It, it's there. It's, I mean, not only does Roman being sexually abused not preclude him from possibly being queer and like both those things playing into his issues with sex, but it makes it more likely that he was a victim of some form of abuse. I agree with that. I think it would make him kind of vulnerable in a way that his siblings weren't. There's so many scenes of Roman kind of flirting with men in bathrooms, making business deals, like seduction type of scenes, that it's it kind of became a meme during season three because it was like two episodes in a row of him like having these exchanges with men in bathrooms. And, you know, the one with Mankin is so is is so kind of explicitly um, playing upon like the flirting with fascism or like, you know, getting into bed with fascism ideas are just like put up there on screen to be very literal. That's like literally what Roman is doing, but also it's like the subtext. Not only is it Roman kind of seeks out maybe these one-on-ones with men in places because he's into that, but also it's um, a really direct way of excluding women and excluding Shiv in particular yeah. from this like s- sphere of influence. Like in Too Much Birthday, after he has that scene with Matson, he goes to Shiv and is like bragging about how he's in the man's club and she's not. So yeah, conducting that in a men's bathroom, which is it sort of like accidentally becomes like homoerotic, but also on like a subconscious level, I think Roman is really seeking that out. It's an interesting contradiction about these very misogynistic fascist spaces is you're very, you know, against women. And yeah, why don't you want women here? Yeah, you only want to talk Are to men about men. You only want to look at men like that's kind of gay, dude the boys club vibes and you know keeping women out of public life as much as possible yeah it it does all kind of feed into a loop so it's kind of interesting that you know maybe roman who is genuinely attracted to men kind of gets like sucked into that or attracted to that i mean he is he is misogynistic as well but (laughs) it goes hand in hand Roman misogynistic gay man. <laughs> I mean, we're both queer women, and I feel like I have ex- definitely experienced some misogyny from gay men. Oh, absolutely. And then, well, I felt like we were teasing our, like, Angels in America uh, thing so much that we have to say something about Angels in America to wrap this up. So obviously, Justin Kirk uh, starred as Prior Walter in the Angels in America miniseries. Great performance. Watch it. We loved it. So one of the characters in Angels in America is... Uh, based on a real-life person, Roy Cohn, who was a lawyer and a very kind of influential man who a lot of people credit with creating, like, Donald Trump as a president, basically, um, that he kind of set him up and saw saw that thing that Donald Trump has that allowed him to kind of become what he has, what he has become. But also, Roy Cohn was a gay man who died of AIDS in uh, 1986, and there's a great um, speech in Angels in America where he talks about that, you know, being gay is not like it's a label that defines your social class. So even though he sleeps with men, he is not gay because gay men don't have, you know, power. They are at the bottom of the food chain. So it's kind of this interesting thing where powerful men and powerful people can kind of distance themselves from those like social signifiers and our sort of modern ideas of like identity and kind of try to rise above it. But then, you know, ultimately that was sort of Roy Cohn's like downfall was that once it was publicly known that he had AIDS, basically everyone like, you know, turned on him for the most part. So just kind of an interesting analog, not super related, but I just wanted to bring it up because I've been watching the Roy Cohn documentaries and it's just crazy. We got angel pilled. We had to bring it up. Yeah. <laughs> I haven't heard anyone make comparisons between Roy Cohn and Megan, but I, there isn't really a comparison in terms of their political position. This was the 80s, and Roy Cohn, it wasn't an open secret that Roy Cohn was gay. You know, it. You said it wasn't? It was. Oh, it was, yes. It was. It was his AIDS status becoming public that made, forced people into a certain stance, but everyone already knew. But it was the 80s, so. You know, he, was, he still didn't have the same level of political power that we've seen make in a crew. And I think we have reached a point where someone could accrue this level of capital, even with maybe a lot of rumors about men being gay, as I suspect Mencken has. I mean, he goes into bathrooms with men. He 
is very he, like feminine. sidles up next to roman at that bar and said so do you want to fuck me <laughs> he's like trying to pick up roman at the rnc i think megan is a very natural descendant of roy Cohn. i was thinking a lot about the politics of angels in america in this and i mean the very scene that became part of the title there are no angels in america it's a country without much history and with a very messy racial dynamic I mean, in a way, it is sort of about the myth making of America. You know, I think I think that's why it uses like Mormonism as like a focal point, which is kind of uh, surprising. And I didn't know that was such a big aspect of it. But like Mormonism is like the American religion. Yeah, it, it definitely does kind of play with some interesting themes that are relevant here. Also, shout out to Ashley Zuckerman, who plays Nate and also played Lewis in a version of Angels in America. Okay, Angels in America is super relevant to succession. That's my only point here. So toward the beginning of this episode, there's a scene between Shiv and Tom where Shiv uh, tells him that she's pregnant. And we didn't talk about this last week because we didn't we didn't know at that point. Um, I think it was like public information. We just hadn't read those particular interviews. But so... Sarah Snook's real-life pregnancy was actually written into this season of Succession. And as of last week, episode 7, it was not yet written in. So when they had that fight on the balcony, the actors and the director did not know that Shiv was pregnant in that scene. And then the scene in episode 4 where she gets that call was added later on. So this is the first episode where it was actually written in. Which, you know, definitely impacted how I viewed things because I was like, oh, that's the whole reason why this scene exists, I guess. But I liked it. I think they are doing a pretty good job with it. What do you think? I'm still in shock that they didn't write it in until like this episode. I know. It just works so well with everything else that happened. And it's really funny to imagine the scene with Shiv drinking or slash not drinking with Lucas. Oh, yeah. And they were actually just like trying to recover you know they'd already filmed this and they were trying to edit it in a way that made it more ambiguous than it was because we were all like oh my god was she drinking and it's like that wasn't even in their minds when they were shooting this nope. but you could do a little bit in the edit to make it more ambiguous or, or or you know make it look like she's not drinking but for the most part i think it's been handled pretty well i am curious about just why they chose to write it in though because I feel like the only reason you write in an actor's pregnancy is if you are not planning on hiding it, like if you're planning on having her be visibly pregnant. Otherwise, why write it in? And if this season is continuing at the same pace, obviously next episode is the funeral, which is tomorrow. So if the finale is only another day or two and we're kind of continuing at this pace... Shiv's not showing yet, you know, she's not going to be showing at the finale. So I, this kind of feeds into my existing like suspicion that we're going to get a little bit of a time skip for that finale episode of a couple months so that she will be more visibly pregnant at that point. I'm still not fully convinced because the idea of a time skip feels a little cheesy to me in a way that I don't think of Jesse as being, especially since they still we're going back and forth with, oh, is this going to be the end? Is it not? And the cast seems to be disagree on whether it really works as an end. But the fact that they decide to write her pregnancy in, and she's clearly not showing at this point, is compelling. We can see what happens, but that was one of my thoughts about this was, oh, yeah, why else write it in? If they do do a time skip, I would rather like the whole finale be a time skip rather than just a scene at the end. And that also does feel more likely. I actually kind of want a little bit of a time skip, like a couple months, just to get a handle on things. I feel like we've been going at this breakneck speed. Yeah. I'm kind of rooting for a little bit of a time skip for the finale episode. But yeah, we shall see. I saw someone on Tumblr. Yes, I was actually on Tumblr. Wow, good for you. Yeah, thanks. Um, I saw this person on Tumblr who actually lost her dad a few years ago, and she was saying how she doesn't remember anything that happened the week her dad died. And she was saying this in the context of succession, like doubting that the kids are really going to remember much of this, and I haven't been able to Well, they're probably going to remember, like, calling the election for Mankin. (laughs) They're going to remember, like, bits and pieces. The last episode is them, like, on a beach somewhere being like, what the fuck did we do? (laughs) 
Oh yeah, and they like laugh about it. Actually, I would love that. Not even gonna lie. It would be a cute sibling scene. Play, just ruin the country and then be like, whatever. I just want the siblings to get back together. Same. We are definitely set up for a lot of conflict between them right now. But I hope that in the end, they will be on somewhat good terms so I can pretend that it lasts forever. But with the pregnancy reveal, Tom's response, you know, he says, is that even true or is that a new position or a tactic? These people are just so broken. There is no trust between them at this point. It is all gone. Yikes, that was gut-wrenching. I mean, Tom was also coked up, but... Look, Tom was coked up. In the last episode, Tom was tired, as he told us many times. Chip's dad died less than a week ago. But the thing is... When people are upset or inebriated, like, they don't become completely different people. You're still saying things that on some level you mean. I was thinking about that here since Chip was asking for a free pass because her dad died, which I think she kind of should get. I think he should be going way easier on her than he is. But also, she wasn't saying those things that she said last night because her dad died. Yeah, for sure. Well, let's, um, let's do our segments. Let's do burn of the week. That's not a good retort. Don't fucking laugh at that. So my burn of the week was not the best burn, but it made me laugh so much that I had to pick it. Are you saying all Aztecs are stupid? Don't be a racist little bitch about it. (laughs) That was good. Top reasons to do coke. My burn of the week was when Frank said Connor was running for president. Great burn from Frank of all people. Suddenly he's on TV conceding and they're like, wait, what? Let's do candy, baby. Ugh. Hot. Ugh. My candy baby was Justin Kirk, the actor. Look, I I found my like line of decency. I'm not gonna make me. <laughs> that would make me feel icky, and I'm glad that I still have the capacity to feel icky. That's nice. Gonna save that. But Justin Kirk is hot, and I wanted to put some shine on him. So he's been doing like the interview circuit this week now with his return and i want to read a couple snippets that were great because he's also very like funny and charming in addition to being hot so um in his interview with vulture he was asked mankin's relationship with roman is something that fans have really responded to can you talk about and then justin cut him off and said whether we're fucking (laughs) justin (laughs) justin have you been reading my fan fiction has he been watching the fan camps And then he went on to blame all of their sexual chemistry on COVID, which was hilarious. He was like, it was my first acting gig in like spring 2021. And I hadn't been around other people in like a year. And, you know, we did our rehearsals in masks. And then when the mask came off with, you know, with Kieran, uh, the sparks were just flying. And I'm like, okay, but what's Kieran Culkin's fucking excuse? Kieran's just like that. Yeah, Kieran is just like that. He's like, I'll give you whatever you're giving me, man. One other little snippet in his interview with uh, Variety, he said that he wasn't sure if he'd be a recurring character, but now he's been elected president. And then the interviewer said, well, sort of. And Justin said, how dare you sort of? I am the president and you will respect me. (laughs) Yes, sir, president, sir. Love that. He's having a blast. (laughs) He's having a blast with his two minutes of screen time and so should we. Who is your candy baby this week? Well, mine was Mankin. <laughs> <laughs> okay, but you're Jewish, so you can pick Mankin. I can't. <laughs> I can pick Mankin. Justin Kirk is Jewish and playing a fascist character. He also mentioned... Yeah, it's woke. Yeah, he's mentioned in interviews that he this is the second Nazi he's played, and he's played like three Jewish characters. I think that's cool. I think that's sexy that he's getting to... It must be kind of fun. Yeah, I think... Getting into that mindset as a Jewish person seems like a fun exercise as an actor. Well, tell, tell me more about me. <laughs> okay, I just, I really love Justin Kurtz's voice, okay? It carries throughout this episode. It is the very first voice we hear at the beginning. And being angel pilled as I am, I was very focused on his voice in that scene. and Had trouble yeah. focusing on what Tom Same. and Greg were saying. <laughs> he has a compelling voice. And obviously when we say compelling, what we mean is hot. His voice gives him a strong presence when he's not in the room. And he just has a lot of confidence, which makes people hot. It is a fact. We're all grown-ups here. We can admit that sometimes horrible people are hot. I bet that, like, in the Succession universe, every single day on Twitter, some lib is getting ratioed for being like, man, it's kind of hot, though. I am a very, like, fictionist fiction kind of person, but I still had some trepidation. I was like, am I going to pick making this episode? There was just 
no one else who really caught my attention in that way. And I'm also going to admit that I considered picking him back in what it takes, but I didn't. Ooh, you should have. That would have been really welcome of you. <laughs> ahead of my time. <laughs> way ahead of your time on that thirst train. <laughs> Let's do best line. Words are just, uh, what? Nothing. Complicated airflow. So, my best line was from Greg, actually. It's not going to change anything if I don't go. Mm-hmm. This line really haunted me. This episode is a series of very small decisions that lead to a hugely dangerous man becoming president. And obviously, Greg is right that if he didn't go, it wouldn't change anything. He is just following orders, like a Nazi. But if everyone didn't go, that would actually change things. We watched everyone in this episode gradually cave to the supposed inevitability of Megan becoming president, and it's fucking sad. Just, I was really sad when this episode ended, to be honest. Yeah, I'm glad you brought up uh, the scene with Greg and Jess, because... That was a really quiet scene, but I think a really important one. And maybe for Jess, she's realizing she's been working for this company and for these people. And, um, you know, there's there's a level of complicity for her that must be complicated as a woman of color um, to kind of realize like, oh, yeah, I have also been kind of contributing to this. Yeah, in a way. I really liked the detail of her immediately pulling out her phone once Greg walked away, presumably to tell someone. Yeah, that was a great scene. My best line was more of a funny one, but oh man. So when Tom said, if I get drowsy and I miscall Colorado, instability, right? Then the US loses credibility, China spots an opportunity and invades Taiwan, tactical newts, fucking shit goes kablooey, and we're back to amoeba. It's a long way back from pond life because you failed to get me a double shot, okay? (laughs) I was like howling at that line when I watched it the first time. That was so fucking funny. Tom just like catastrophizing all the way back to having to re-evolve human life on Earth world-class moment. Tom was on fire in this episode. His disgust with the bodega sushi. I mean, the bodega sushi was a, was a pivotal element. We didn't even talk about the wasabi LaCroix situation, so we gotta slip that in here. That was hilarious as well. They had some nice moments of levity in this episode. Well, let's do number one boy. You're my boy. You're my number one boy. This was a tough one this yeah. week because everyone was at their worst. And, you know, I'm not going to overplay it. We've all, everyone's like, oh my god, everyone's so evil. And then everyone's like, yeah, they were always evil. And it's just like such an annoying, like, cycle. I'm still going to be standing Roman as soon as he does, as soon as he's sad again. I'll be back here crying about Roman. So you can catch me doing that. Next episode, I'm going to be on one as a Roman girly. But tough one, but Shiv. I know that she had her own, you know, ulterior motives. And the fact that she lied and you know didn't call nate and wasn't pushing for that i guess showed that she was maybe prioritizing her own power a little bit above kind of risking the outcome there but i'm just like criticizing shiv as my number one boy this is all this is all a caveat that's what being um, a success event is you're like this yeah. person really fucked up that is my this number person one boy. did terribly but i mean god it, it's still it's still just hard to see her fall flat on her face like this oh yeah. my goodness and yeah i mean sarah snook is just so incredible love watching her and it was just tough it was tough to see everyone everyone turn on her and that scene you know was really shot from her point of view there where it felt like this horror scene where she's watching Kendall and Greg through the window and Roman's you know being an idiot in in her ear and she's hardly paying attention to him and then yeah it just yeah man I don't know where she's gonna go from here but this was this was sad yeah very tough episode for Shiv Sarah is always pretty harsh on Shiv but I think it does make for a great performance like she Lily understands Shiv and the lack of self-awareness behind everything she does. Who was your number one boy? So it always feels a little like cheating to pick a number one boy who's not one of the Roy kids or, you know, Tom, one of the mains. But I really was feeling it here and wanted to shout out a different character. So my number one boy was Darwin. Nice! Elliot Schwartz from Breaking yeah. Bad. I had a predilection for the actor, but I was really charmed by his character. Yeah. I work in analytics, and the thing about analytics is it is all bullshit. Okay, you decide which part of the data to look at, and from there you can say pretty much anything that you want. Succession captured this really well, and I felt for Darwin, okay? 
He held out longer than the other characters before compromising his ideals. And in an episode like this, I do have to celebrate that. That's a good choice. He he was fun in this episode. And he got wasabi and lemon LaCroix poured in his eyes. Yes, I love that. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't suspect he was a one-episode character, but he worked great as a one-episode character. LaCroix's getting a lot of play this season. Did you know LaCroix from La Crosse, Wisconsin? I didn't, just like you. Well, not La Crosse, Wisconsin. I'm not from La You're from Wisconsin. Come on, that's I, the opposite. I know, we just that went is over... the opposite side of the state, Savannah. Just, I just, you know, East I meant elite. just that you're from Wisconsin. You know that. <laughs> I know, I know. And I forgot to say this earlier, but since I was reading a lot of Justin Kirk interviews, um, he said that he thinks that Mankin is either from Minnesota or Wisconsin. He did. And I hope it's Minnesota. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to say Minnesota because that would mean that in the Succession universe, Minnesota has its first president ever because <laughs> we kind of flopped with Mondale there a bit. But <laughs> congratulations, Tom's dog's you guys. namesake. Congratulations, Minnesota. We did it. Someday there may be, you know, buildings in Minnesota in the succession you'd birth named after making. <laughs> That's what oh, you just God. willed into existence. Great. Now, I kind of want a Tom Mankin scene where Tom tries to be the old, I'm also from Minnesota. Yeah, they should they should go head to head about being from Minnesota. And Justin Kirk uh, grew up in Minnesota. He did. So. There's a lot of Minnesota representation on succession. Just for you. Well, looking ahead to the funeral next week, um, the teaser makes me so crazy I don't even want to talk about it. Also, just to back up a little, did anyone else laugh when Kendall said, see you at the funeral tomorrow? (laughs) Yeah. This is crazy. Like, you couldn't have bumped it a couple days? They made a very conscious choice to make everything one day this season. Pretty nuts. Everyone's going to be so sleep deprived. We're going to get a Buffy-style finale where they're all asleep. Roman is so just unhinged and I know that a couple weeks ago I was talking to Big Game about how I love unhinged Roman and I can't wait to see more Ah. can you wait to see more I'm really excited but I think people keep saying like oh Roman's gonna die no I'm gonna die that's the actual (laughs) plot twist that's what everyone should be afraid of Roman's gonna be fine but I'm gonna die gonna be nuts and you know we are gonna cover the last two episodes here but our upload schedule is going to be a little bit unpredictable and kind of later in the week for sure. Don't be looking for us on Tuesday or probably even Wednesday morning um, for the next couple weeks. Um, and the reason for that is that I am moving out uh, to Glacier National Park. I got a job there for the summer season and I have my orientation on Monday. I can't wait to go to my orientation Monday morning right after watching the funeral episode of Succession. You'll be living just like a Succession character. This is my Succession. I'm gonna have to pretend to be so normal all day meeting new people that I'm gonna spend the next four and a half months with. It's gonna be hard. I'm gonna have to try and scrape together like a watch party if anybody is a Succession fan out there. I will host a Succession finale watch party in my cabin. But yeah, so we're going to have to, you know, it's just hard to predict what my like schedule is going to be. Also, Savannah is, will be editing the last two episodes, which is a big help. Um, and I kind of have this like ADHD hyper focus thing where I just sit still for like 10 hours and edit the episodes. I'm not expecting Savannah to do that. Savannah you can take still your time. has a full-time job, unlike you. So, so even when I had a full-time job, I still did that. <laughs> just all night. Yeah, you did. So... Not expecting Savannah to do that. Take your time. I would also imagine our last two are going to be longer than an hour because the episodes are longer than an hour, which also will just add to like the editing workload as well. Yeah, as well um, as the fact that I've never done this before. Since and the you fact that you love the editing before. so much that I let you do it yourself. I understand why Logan Roy didn't want to give up power. Yeah, so that's what you can expect from us. Um, we will be back just... Don't know exactly when, especially for next week, because I just have no idea. Like, I'm not going to get there until Monday, so I have no idea what's going to be going on in my life next week. (laughs) Yay, I'm so excited. (laughs) I'm scared. I'm terrified. I'm excited. Thank you for listening this week. You can uh, help us out by liking the video, subscribing, especially um, if you want to know when we upload next week, you know, subscribing or hitting the bell that's the thing that youtubers say you can actually get like a notification of when we post if you want to know that 
for whatever reason that probably works fine you can turn it off after the next two weeks you know whatever who cares i don't i'm not gonna be posting anyway like i'm gonna be fucking hanging out with the mountain goats climbing mountains all summer hell yeah <laughs> i'm gonna get so normal <laughs> i'm gonna get in shape and tan and normal <laughs> uh, and offline two and a lie. <laughs> I'm going to be so offline all summer. I can't you wait. are going to be offline. That, by necessity, you will be offline. And if you want, you can uh, support us on Ko-fi. The link is below. You can give us a few dollars to support us. Give us some walking around money. <laughs> you can buy a little coffee with our Ko-fi money. Should I mention my student loans? <laughs> yeah, mention your student loans. <laughs> I have student loans with that is relevant to anyone if that helps thanks so much for listening um uh, this was a this was a great episode um i can't believe you only have two left ah. i know i can't handle it i know it's crazy and they're gonna pack so much into these episodes and they're longer yeah an hour and 15 and an hour and a half that's nuts that's crazy i just wonder uh, how long ugh. the original script was because we know there's a ton that gets cut from the episodes already yeah and the scripts are starting to drop now. The, f- the first three season book scripts are out in the UK. So people are posting snippets of them. But us oppressed Americans don't get them until July. Even though Succession is an American show. It I know. To us. I know. Jesse, stop playing favorites. I think that's it from us. Thank you for listening. We'll see you for the last two. Thank you for listening. Crazy. <laughs> Bye. I was able to watch the episode with my parents this week, which I don't usually do, so I'm sitting down with them, too. <laughs> my dad's chewing. <laughs> Eating pretzels. Um, what, so what did you think of the episode? I liked it. No, I no. forgot what it was called. <laughs> America Decides. Oh, that's right. The oh, yeah. Election. Well, that's yeah. obviously a slam on Fox News. Yeah. Do you have any favorite characters? <laughs> Oh, I just think Roman's a dick. I love Roman. <laughs> yeah, you two uh, don't agree on that. Who's your favorite, Mom? Um, I I lean towards Tom. I yeah. Think. He had so many good lines. Tom was really funny. Yeah. yeah. I loved his lines this week, especially about the amoeba. And... That was my best line. Yeah. What was that it? Podcast. Oh, yeah, that... You'll have to listen. Not that far back to the pond. Not <laughs> not a long way back to pond life. That was it. Or it is a long way back to pond <laughs> life. Yeah. It is a long way yeah. back. No, it was good. It was intense. Right. Thank you. You think that was a keeper? <laughs>